exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our Amen. What a crew. Wow. Good morning, everyone. All right. So these um, are our announcements. First of all, if this is your first time at a Greater Grace service, we just would like to recognize you. And the way how we do that, if you don't mind raising your hand um, so we can acknowledge you, would be great. Is there anyone? Welcome. 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 Um, anyone else? One here. One over here. Two right here. Wow, awesome. That's great. So, um, folks, if you don't mind keeping your hands raised so we can make sure you get, uh, a, yeah, the two right here. Yeah, 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 you guys. Okay. Yeah, good job. Um, and our ushers will come right over and, and give you a visitor's packet. So, in the visitor's packet, it tells you about who we are, a little bit about who we are, and then an opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, and that would be awesome. Um, so, tonight, um, is family life service at the 630 service. Um, so it's going to be an amazing time, um, portion for our kids and our families, um, just something very practical for us in the day we are in. And then um, April 28th, mark that in your calendar, will be Welcome Sunday, um, where we will have, after service, we'll have lunch and give a tour of the uh, campus, um, and so just mark that in your calendar. And then um, next Sunday um, in the um, GGCA Chapel, we're going to have a face-to-face -face service for Jermaine Andreas, um, amazing woman of God, um, just decades and decades, soul winner, um, in the days of Flag House and Somerset and Lafayette, she would go down and soul win and pick up kids 
young kids and teenagers and bringing them to youth events. And so, and then um, register now for the NBCNS banquet on mbcns.edu. That will be May 24th at 6 p.m. Um, if you are an alumnus, if you went to NBCNS and you graduated, um, there is a discount of 15%. So just go to the um, NBCNS and we'll, um, website and you can sign up there. And then there will be some free native trees that are available like we did last year. Um, if you would like more information on the types of trees available, go and see the Welcome Center, okay? All right, um, this morning, Pastor Schaller, uh amazing verse, uh, a message. And something that, um, there's a phrase he said that kind of stuck with me. And I was just thinking of this day and age. So Christ is resurrected from the dead, correct? Um, but the world and the devil wanted to keep him buried, right? Because if he rose from the dead, there's what? Victory, right? But it also happens in our lives. The devil would love for us to keep the things of God buried. And, and this is a terminology we hear today. I don't want to hear it. Don't talk about that. That's not practical today. We don't need that here. But it's interesting. There's a, there's a portion of Scripture in Acts chapter uh, 5. And I was thinking about this because this is amazing. So the disciples, um, they, were, they were doing the work of God. And it, and it says this, that, um, excuse me, not Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 3. Uh, Acts chapter 4, correct. Okay, we're, doing, we're okay. All right, uh, verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man that was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. A miracle had happened. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves and said, What shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done, and is by and is by them is manifest unto all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them and speak to them henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But this is what I love. But Peter and John answered and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken more unto you than unto God, you judge. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, we're not going to bury Jesus Christ because he's resurrected. And in our personal lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, at our jobs, we're not going to shut up. We're going to talk about the things that God has done in our lives personally and corporately. And this is amazing because when you do that, and we had this experience yesterday in Richmond. We were down in Richmond with uh, Jesse and Kaylee, amazing team down in Richmond doing a great work. And we were on the campus of VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University talking to young people about Christ resurrected, a resurrected Christ practically in our lives. And people were open, and they wanted to hear. Tell me more. We, uh, just short, we were at this bus stop, and we looked at, gave this lady a gospel track, and she said, oh, are y'all Christians? Yes, ma'am. She said, this is what Richmond needs. People on the streets sharing their faith. And she said to us, she said, don't be discouraged. Keep going. Do it more because God is working here. And we're like, wow, amen. Amen. But practically in this story, we see the kingdom of darkness, the flesh and the world would want the things of God to be buried. Don't talk about church. Well, they want us to talk about everything else in the world. We talk about Jesus Christ. We talk about our young people talk about Jesus Christ. Our teenagers talk about Jesus Christ. GGCA, we're talking about Christ. NBCNS, we're talking about Christ. The Learning Center, we're talking about Christ. On Outreach, we're talking about Christ. In our families, in our lives, we talk about Jesus Christ 
resurrected. Because that is the answer for the world we live in. And just practically, people are buried. They're buried in finances. They're buried in problems. They're buried. They can't find a way out. And you know what the answer that God does? You and me. He puts us into that situation. And you ever in a situation and they're like, hey, have you ever had a problem and you just didn't know what to do? And we're like, oh, me? Yeah, you. Uh, Of course. Well, tell me about it. And sometimes you don't want to talk. But like Jeremiah, the word of God is a fire in your bones. And it's like bubbling and it's like, and you open your mouth and they're like, how long have you known this? Uh, about 34 years. Where do you go to church? And you tell them about church. But this morning and in our lives, we're not burying Christ because he's not buried. He's resurrected. He is risen. He's ascended. He's seated. He's interceding. And the great news is he's coming back. And this is our lives. Amen. Amen. Welcome with me, Pastor John Hadley. Okay. Okay. Good morning. So, thank you. So I look out, I see somebody very special. My mother. And I'd like to uh, say something about giving because, um, Mom, you've been a giver your whole, all your 91 years. And uh, I remember I have a scene in my head from way back. In our bedroom, we had three sets of bunk beds with John and Dave, Joe and Jim, and Patrick and Paul. And Matthew was in the crib somewhere. And the girls were somewhere. And there was one time we all got sick in unison. I mean really sick. And guess who was on cleanup patrol? I think we pushed her over the edge on that one, but because she was uh, always selfless and giving, always cooking. We always, not always, but often we had an extra neighbor or two sitting at the table. I don't think she noticed. Just a couple more faces. And uh, she was always, always looking out for others, always giving of herself. And, and pretty much always happy. And uh, we lived near an intersection and there were a lot of accidents because it was a two-way stop sign. So wouldn't you know, she rode to town hall and got two more stop signs put up. So there were no more accidents. Go mom. And also, just finally, uh, we had two special needs neighbors and they were, uh, without exaggeration, always at our house. Always there because she was a refuge. She was a refuge. Thank you, Mom. So I think she, uh, and always uh, instilling in us uh, Bible principles. And um, she learned a secret, and that is truly it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Lord, thank you for our mothers. You know it's not Mother's Day, but every day we want to honor our father and mother. And we ask you to bless this time when we can give back to you of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.
I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me. took me by the hand you marched me out in freedom into the promised land oh and i will not forget you i'll sing of all you've done death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love you stepped into my egypt you took me by Okay, let's all stand. And after you have stood, uh, just encourage one another.
<clears throat> okay, you may be seated. Uh, let's see, Pastor Andrew and Laura, you want to stand for a second? Okay, so this couple is moving to West Virginia to plant a church. They're going to plant a church. Their family in Morgantown, right? Morgantown. So we're going to work together to see that happen. That'll be fun. And he's going to preach the gospel there. The spirit will move and work there. So we have you in our hearts and prayers. And that'll be April 27th. They're moving there in a few weeks. All right. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we have gathered in your name to hear something, to receive something from you. In our hearts, we are hungry. We are your people. We are honored to be indwelt by your spirit and called by your name. We belong to you. This assembly and the assemblies around the world called by your name, honored by your grace, loved and forgiven on the earth still until the time. We thank you, Lord, for leading us, comforting us, teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, turn to John chapter 7. I <clears throat> have a lot of things to say this morning, but I want to hopefully we'll make it clear and the Lord will help us. I would like you to just see, we're going to look at John 8, but before we go, I want to put it in a context and notice something in John chapter 7, and that is the confusion about who is Jesus Christ. So John 7 is, they don't really know. Look at chapter 7, verse 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. This is the theme of the chapter. Who is he? How did he get his education? Where did he come from? His family is not believing. His brothers and sisters are not believing in him. Look at verse 12. There was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives the people. Verse 15. The Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Translation. Where did he get his education? Who was the rabbi that taught him? How did he learn these things? Who is he? Verse 20. The people answered and said, You have a devil who goes about to kill thee. Verse 27. Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ comes, no man knows whence he is. Verse 31, many of the people believed on him. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests and sent officers to take him, to arrest him. Verse 43, there was a division among the people because of him. Do you get the idea? He's a mystery. Where did he come from? Who is he? Yeah, he has a devil. No. Yeah, yes. No. He's a good man. No. He, he's deceiving people. Okay. And then they all go to their own house. In verse 53, and every man went unto his own house. I kind of think that that's what happens when we don't know him. We just go to our own house. We kind of go to our own life. We just live our own life. When we don't know him, who is he? I don't know. Some say this, some say, I don't know. But I, I just go home. I go to my own house. 
So now in John 8, we have Christ stepping up to the plate, so to speak, coming into the picture with this authority. He's in the picture in 7, but now we see some very strong confrontation happening. And he's very good at it. He's very clear. This clarity is important for you and me. This clarity, it comforts us. This clarity is our authority. This clarity is, uh, is uh, love, peace, confidence, encouragement. This clarity that comes from God from the voice of God in this world. And this is what they lacked in John 7 in the text. There's the same group of people in John 8, or it's very sim similar. I don't know that it's exactly the same people, but it's in the same uh, environment. And, uh, and Jesus is there. And there's basically confrontation with a Jewish sect and there were many Jewish sects in the first century. There were, there were uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, there were Herodians, there were Hellenist Jews, there were very secular Jews, there were uh, Orthodox Jews, and so on. They, they were, but, but the group that really targeted Jesus, the ones that were really angry with him and hated him were the Pharisees. Yeah, because they knew, the, the Pharisees knew the Bible, but so did Jesus. And the Pharisees that knew the Bible were very interested in what he was teaching. And when he was teaching in a way that challenged them, there was a reaction. So we'll see that in John 8. Now, I want to also set it in a context for your life and my life in a practical way. And I hope that will become clear that no matter what century we live in, if we don't have the clarity, then there's something missing in our hearts and in our lives. If we don't have the clarity of what he is saying and, and be, be receiving what he has to say to us, then there's something missing in my life. And I get very much occupied with my life instead of being a worshiper of him. Let me repeat that, just make a sketch. It's very easy to be occupied with your life. You know, very easy, our life, my life. And um, there's a certain words, maybe we could make, make a point about condemnation. I want to explain what that is in a minute. It's Romans 8, 1, Romans 8, 1, and 1 John 3, 19 to 21. If your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. If your heart condemns you, and condemnation is a very common thing with us as people. We condemn ourselves in many ways. Condemnation is what I shouldn't have done, but I did it. What I, what I um, should do, but I don't do it. What, what I should do, but I don't do enough of it. Or what I shouldn't do, but I did it. And how, how easy it is for us to live in condemnation. Even when I haven't done anything particularly wrong. Sometimes I woke up in the morning and I asked my wife, was I here last? I, I, I'm waking up and I feel like I murdered somebody last night. That's how guilty I am. I wake up guilty. I wake up condemning myself. I wake up, I live in condemnation. People do. They, and sometimes sensitive people are condemning themselves for things that are kind of ridiculous. Like I parked in the wrong parking place or something. Very silly. Or what I should have done or I didn't do and so on. So that's like something very interesting about people. But when you hear from above, when Jesus is speaking to you from above, then that gives you another life. Not this one, but you actually end up becoming a worshiper. 
you end up being a worshiper. You get focused on Christ. You hear him. You are drawn to him, and you worship him. This is your new life. This is what Jesus is saying in John 8. So he's making a distinction between these two. Let's say this way. <clears throat> um, here's me in my w little world of condemnation, and then this is you and me, and we'll put arms up like this, and we are free, and we worship, and we realize something a lot bigger than us. We are, we are in the spirit. We are understanding. We are loved. We are encouraged. We are forgiven. We are called by his name. We're realizing something more than ourselves. All right, so this is a, a long, long text, but from chapter 8, verse 20. Three, and we'll just go verse by verse for quite a while, and then until it's you know when we're crying out for food and water, then we'll <laughs> dismiss you. <laughs> verse twenty, <laughs> no, it's verse twenty-three. Okay, and he said unto them, "You are from beneath; I am from above. You are of this world." I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Okay, so here, here we have a simple picture here of a man who lives his life and he dies. He dies in what? in his sin okay he dies in his sins okay what a statement that is really Lord yes you die in your sins you don't have anything more than that yeah but I have good works yeah but your good works are filthy rags in the eyes of God in Isaiah 64 yeah, but, but um, I, I may, I, I'm sincere. Yeah, your sincerity can't save you. Your sincerity can't take your sins away. You are, pe you are people, but you are, you are religious people, but you will die in your sins. Because your religion cannot save you. You need a savior. I am from above. You are from below. And you will die in your sins. Later in the text, he says, your father is the devil. He's very strong with these people. He's telling them how it is. They are unsaved. They don't know who Jesus is. They need him, but they will not come to him because they are, they are, um, they are fortified in their life. They are fortified in their worldview or in their, their, their mindset. And he's trying to break through. He's trying to speak to them. He's trying to reach them. But in doing that, he speaks to us about what we have. What they have, we'll make a comparison. What they have in their life, we'll see in the chapter, and then what we have in our life. Okay, turn to verse 25. Then said they unto him, who are you? What a good question. Who are you? Who are you? Well, I am from above. You're from below. Well, we don't believe you. Well, then, that, then I'll, I'll tell you what's going on. Jesus said, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Who is the Father? God. Father God in heaven. That Jesus is saying, the Father sent me, and I'm here talking to you. And this is, you need to hear me, but you can't hear me. Verse um, 
28. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. I think we all understand this. There is a transfer from the Father, God, in heaven to Jesus Christ on the earth. When you saw Jesus, you saw the Father, in a sense. You saw God. When you heard him, you were hearing what God in heaven is saying. Christ is on the earth saying it. Verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And he spake these words, and many believed on him. So he's actually having a ministry to these people that are. You know, that happens to us also. When we hear the word, we, we just kind of, we kind of sit back. We're listening and watching, and we hear, we start to believe this is true. I start to believe it. That's another thing about human beings. We die in our sins and also we struggle with condemnation. Well, we, do, we as believers don't die in our sin. Believers do not, I hope you understand that. A believer doesn't die in his sin. He dies in Christ. He's in Christ, not in his sin. I hope you know that. You don't go to the judgment at the white throne you don't have that judgment. You're not being judged for your sins as the world is, the unbeliever. He dives in his sins and the books will be open and all the works that they have done will be judged. They'll be judged out of the books and cast into the lake of fire in Revelation 12, I mean, uh, 20, verses 12 to 15. But not the believer. He is not in his sin. You are not in your sin. Your sins are in the deepest sea, Micah 7, 19. Your sins are as far as the east from the west, Psalm 103. Your sins are not remembered anymore, Hebrews 8, 12. Your sins are gone. Now, that's amazing. Our sins are gone. God cannot find them. They are not there. He remembers them no more. And by the way, condemnation is also not in God. I said that already. You are not condemned. You are not condemned. You, are, you, are, you, are, you have something else. But these people have it. They have the condemnation because of John, John 3, 17 to 19. We see it there in the scripture 19. Sorry. The, um, and they are... Uh, Condemned already, all right? John 5, 24 is another one, all right? So, turn to chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So here we have another <clears throat> picture here, is that you have freedom. You have the truth. You are actually from above. You are born from above. And God is your father. And he doesn't condemn you. But he, you, you are his, and you continue in the word. You have the word that, that you are born from by believing. Word, the incorruptible seed, not of, not of incorruptible, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, the word of God. That's why you are born of God, by believing in him, believing in his word. And then... Then he says in verse 32, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. 
How sayest thou you shall be made free? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. The servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This freedom point is is spiritual. It's not political freedom. It's not being a slave. Uh, Like in Egypt, they were slaves. It's not um, uh, your, your social status. It's spiritual. Free indeed. You are actually free from sin. You're free from yourself. You're free from uh, the things that burden us so easily. Uh, we're free from guilt. Uh, we're free from fear. We are free, free from shame. Uh, we could make mistakes, but we are, we are restored. We are loved. We are free. We are free indeed. So that's the meaning here in this um, clear verse 37, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And that phrase is, is like a good one. My word has no place in you. Let's make a place. Let's draw a man. There's a man. You can't tell, but it is. And, and he, the word has a place in him. The word is there. He received it. It was in, it's in his heart. I cannot describe to you what that means. I just know when, when it happens, it happens to you. It does. It happens that you hear a word and, and, it, in, and it carries, it grows. It's a seed planted. It's the word. It has a place in you. You actually may be surprised it's there, and then you have it in you, and you enjoy it. The word has a place in me. And I believe that's what happened in your appetite as a, as a believer. What happened was, like, this is a big book. How could this word have a place in me? Like, but, but what if just a part of it, it speaks to my spirit, my heart, and it has a place in me. Then, then that's what Jesus is saying to these people. You can't hear me. As he describes here in a minute, we'll see. It's like hearing somebody's in the other room, like, you know, behind the wall over here. I'll turn my microphone off and talk back here. hear me maybe not but you can maybe hear that somebody is there you hear that somebody's in behind the wall I don't know what they're saying but I hear them talking but I don't know what they're talking about this is what he says to these people he said you hear me but you can't understand me you know I'm here and I'm talking but you don't get it you don't have a place in your heart for me and that happens, that's like in the world. The world doesn't have a place in their heart for God and what God is saying. Yes, they have a place in their heart for God, but they want God to be their own, their own way, their own God. Yeah, I believe in God, but hey, 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 back off. I believe in God. My, I've got my God. You know, I'm good. Let me alone. Yes, I hope you are good. I don't know that. But if Jesus, were, if Jesus would, would talk to you, he, he might say that you don't know. You say you do, but you don't know. And he went even further and stronger with them and said these things. Let's go to the, what did he say, actually? He said, um, verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Oh, wait a minute. We're talking about fathers now. Yes, we are. We're talking about fathers. What is a father? It's like where you come from. 
my father, I come from above, but your father is from below. Your father is the devil. He says that here. We'll read it in a second. Your father, look at, look at the picture of these people. Number, number one, they die in their sins. Number one, they're in, or number two, they're in bondage. They're not free. And number three, their father is not a good guy. These people are lost. These people are religious. These people are very secure in, and they hate him. They hate him. They're going to kill him. I mean, they're not going to just kind of like push him out of town. They're going to destroy him. They're going to rip him to pieces. They're going to kill him. They, they are targeting him. They don't like it. It's kind of a picture of the human, human race, like in our worst where, where there's actually a target, and the target is God. It's like if God showed up anywhere in the world, he would be targeted as an enemy. And you might say, no, not good people. Not a, No, this is spiritual. And you have no idea what, what a spiritual world means if you think just being a good person is going to get you through. It isn't. Just being a good guy is not the answer to this world because you're not actually a good guy. When you get down to it and it really goes like to where reality is, it's God against evil. And we are on the evil side. Unless we are born of God. And we are by God's grace. And so let's, let's see where it goes here. Verse um, I've got to make note of where I stopped because I'm, is it 39? They answered, Abraham is our father. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. That's verse 39. Verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. By the way, I hope you understand, I am in no way anti-Semitic, you know, not even close. I am so much for Jewish people. I am so much for these, the, the, the Bible, what the Bible has taught me. I am so much into the Jewish scriptures. I am so much into our faith and the Messiah and the church and what God has done. I am so much into it. But when I read these things, I realize it's not about it's not about a race of people. It's about the nature of the human heart and how capable we are, how prone we are to, to miss it and not understand what is really happening. And this is where, where Jesus comes in in your life so that you and I would be awake and aware. So verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we be not born of fornication. That's a low blow. He's, they're suggesting, Mary, your mother, Jesus, we did the research, your mother wasn't married when you were born. We know we were not born in fornication. Maybe you were. Yeah, well, well, you don't know what you're talking about. That's the answer to that. But they're, they, they're, they're in battle here with him. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, verse 42, If God were your father, you would, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. And by the way, I believe... Now, you could hear a preacher, but you might hear the sounds, but you may not get it, what he's saying, because that's happened to me many times, I'm sure. I'm listening, but I need to really listen and really be a worshiper and receive what is being said and hear what God is saying in the word as worshipers in the congregation, because these words are what we base our life on. 
Because of these words, we can better raise our family. Because of these words, I can better be a worker at work. And because of these words, I can better be a neighbor in my neighborhood. And because of these words, I can overcome the temptations. I'm not perfect, we aren't, but because of these words, we have some authority in our life to live a different way. We can love, we have joy, we have peace because of these words, words, words from God. All right, chapter eight, verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. My speech is like mumblings to you, words behind the wall, but you cannot hear me. You of your father, the devil, verse 44. And the lusts of your father will you do. What are the lusts of their father? Their father is the devil. What are the lusts of the devil? Power, Power. okay. What, are, what lust does the devil have? What, is he, what does he do? What does he want to do? He loves to destroy. He loves to rip things apart. He's a destroyer. He loves to deceive. He loves to cheat. He loves the broken heart. He loves to push down, bury. When Jesus was buried in the tomb, Pilate and the Pharisees had counsel together, and they said, the Pharisees said to Pilate, his, this, he said he would be raised in three days, so make sure the tomb is secure. And Pilate said, I agree with you. Because if they, if they steal the body, the Pharisee, they said, the disciples may come and steal the body, then it'll be worse. And Pilate said, yeah, it can't get worse. It can't get worse. Make sure that doesn't happen. We got to seal the tomb. That, what's the lust of the devil? Keep him buried. Keep him buried. Keep the Bible buried. Keep the Bible out of the school. Keep the Bible out of the child. Keep the Bible out of the teenager's hands. Keep it buried. Keep mom and dad buried in their lives. They don't have anything to say at the breakfast table. They don't have any love in their hearts. Bury them. Bury the kids. Bury the family. Bury the mom and dad. Bury the kids. Bury the boss. Bury the country. Destroyed. The lusts of the devil are murder, adultery, cheating, deceitful hearts. Right? Let's read what he says, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. You will raise up an army and destroy Europe. Who, who, who did that? Who raised up a million, four million man army, Adolf Hitler? He did it in a few years. Four and a half million German soldiers to wipe out a generation and destroy Europe. Millions of people in Russia died. Millions in Europe died. Jews died in the furnaces. Millions, is this the devil? Is that evil? Okay. If he is my father, what do you think? I would be a professional guy, but I got the ability to steal money using my computer. I got the ability to destroy a neighborhood. I got the ability to oppress the poor. I got the ability to bring in addictions, to do drug deals. I can destroy on high level and low level life. That's what the devil does. And I, I'm sorry, I'm emphasizing it, but I can't help it. I think we need to realize that a lot of life that is people that are suffering, and you are not part of that. You are not part of that because you are born from above. And you, the word has a place in your heart. And nurture that in your heart and receive it and more of it and worship Jesus Christ with purity of heart and humility of heart. 
and get rid of your stuff. I had friends, the Zolas, up in Massachusetts, and they got saved by a radio program with Dr. Stevens, and they had a cabinet, hundreds of dollars of alcohol. And she told me, see Zola, she's a fireball. She just took bottle after bottle right down the toilet, bottle after bottle, like thousands of dollars. I guess, I don't know, I'm making it up probably, but a lot of it. I mean, the, the, the fish were drunk all I mean, I don't know where, it, <laughs> it cleansed out the whole sewer system of the city. Now, how could anybody have the authority to do a thing like that? It must be something from above. Guys, we don't have that. We don't have that. I, that's maybe the point this morning. We don't have what it is that Jesus Christ came in to, the, to bring. We don't have it by nature. Let's go read it, because I want you to leave in good time. Verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Verse 45, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. You're not of God. That's all. That's it. I mean, it's just Jesus saying it. It's just Jesus is saying that. That's, that's all, I, you know. Verse 48, then answered the Jews, now they're, they're, they're in the game. Say we not well that you are a Samaritan and has the devil? And Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There's one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead in the prophets, and you say, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Who are you, if you could say this thing? That now we know you have a devil. Now we know it. So they're, they don't know. I mean, he answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham re rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. I wonder what it means. See, it was Abraham, did he see the coming of the Messiah? Did Abraham, did he see the city? He looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. Did he somehow see the Messiah? Did he understand it? Did he, how did he see Christ coming into the world. How did he see that? But Jesus said, Abraham saw that. And then he says, then said the Jews unto him, verse 57, you are not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Now this is 2,000 years. Jesus is 2,000 years after Abraham, right? Jesus said, verily, verily, I send you before Abraham was, I am. Well, there you go. The, the I am. Where do we get I am? Moses at the, at the burning bush. What is your name, God? I am that I am. I am. They knew what he was saying, that he is the I am. Before Abraham was, I am God. I am God. I am God in the flesh. I am the Messiah. 
in John chapter 4. I am the answer for your life. Now, I want to just say, to apply it to our lives, I want you to understand that your life, people in the world don't have what you have. Look at it up here on the screen. What you have is something that actually it grows, okay? What you have is actually very, very this is small. This world is a small world. Have you ever lived in a cellar? I have. Have you ever had no money? I have. Have you ever been lost and no, no? Have you ever been in a country you don't speak the language, get thrown off the train, you don't know where you are, and you can't speak the language, and you're, you're in a place? I have. Have you ever been like put trapped in something small? I have. Have you ever been had bad habits and can't get out of it? I have. Have you ever been in bondage to your sin? I have. Have you been afraid of death? Yes. Have you ever afraid of going to prison one day? Maybe. Yes. The world that we live in is is not that great. I love it, but on the other hand, it can catch you grab a hold of you, throw you down, beat you, murder you, lie to you, destroy you, tear you up. But Jesus said, I came from above. And you, you don't have a place in your heart for me. And you don't have it, and you will die in your sin. And you are lost, and the devil is your father. But if you believe in me, you are born from above. You have the Holy Spirit. I have many things to say to you, and I set you free. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And will you still live in the basement? Maybe, but I got joy unspeakable. Do you still have problems like other? I do, but I have something else going on in my life too. I have Jesus Christ in my life. I have a living God. I have a God that hears our prayer and answers our prayer. I have sisters and brothers I never had before. I have a future. I have a purpose. Life is short, and one day we'll leave our body and go and be with God in heaven at a table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the wedding garments of the wedding garment is ours, the righteousnesses of the saints. And the city of God, whose, fill, uh, whose builder and maker is God. And that city is described in the book of Revelation with 12 gates and foundation stones of, are the apostles. And they are made of pearl, the pearly gates. Yeah, I, just, I met a guy in Habit of Grace and I, he was an old retired veteran and, and he was sad on the porch and also glad and we talked. And he said, my wife died last year, and I'm here by myself. And I said, what, what's going on? He goes, oh, I believe in Jesus. I told my wife I'll meet her at the Southern Gate. I go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, we got an appointment at the Southern Gate. I'm going to meet my wife there. I go, really? So I'm like trying to draw more out of him because he's really believing. He's really believing. It's in his heart. How true that is. What about you? Do you have anything going on in your life? Are you willing to give up on your Christianity and not believe in it anymore? Are you willing to compensate with a, a compromise with the devil and say, he's buried, don't let him out, he's buried. And the devil say, I got the, I'm dancing on Jesus' grave. The devil says, I'm dancing on Jesus Christ's grave. He's buried and he's not coming out. Or are you, or what, what? How, how would you finish the message if you were me right now? <laughs> the devil is dancing on Jesus' grave. He's not getting out. Keep him buried. Keep the Bible buried. Keep the church buried. Keep all the goodness buried and keep it, keep it all down. Nobody know about it. Don't ever talk about it. Just go on in our dumb, stupid, foolish, small way. No way. No, Jesus is alive. And the book of Acts, yeah, and the, <laughs> and the book of Acts tells us, and the book of Acts shows us what happens when we hear it and believe it. 
and we're, da we're dancing on the devil's grave. Amen. And we're believing not in what he is saying, we're believing in what the Lord is saying, and it's growing in us. And we have it, and we're thankful for it. We are victorious, we are more than conquerors, and nothing can separate us from his love. Amen. 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 Maybe you're sitting here, you're not sure where you are right now in, the, in this church or what's happening here. You might not know for sure. You might not be a believer. But we want to encourage you and say to you that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead for you. He shed his blood for you. And all your sins, all the stuff, all the stuff that's happened in your life is gone forgiven, washed away, forgotten, dealt with. God has received you as his child. He is for you. He puts your name in his book by you believing in him. And it's that simple. Say, Jesus, come into my heart today. And he does. He's with you. Start to talk to him. Trust him. Turn from your own ideas, your own way. Put your trust in him and start to hear from him. And it'll grow in your heart. You'll learn more. For you are a child of God today if you put your trust in Christ today. Put your trust in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, that was good. Let's all stand. And if the Greater Grace Pastors can come down and be available for prayer, uh, if you have a prayer request or um, you want them just to expound on something you heard in the message this morning, um, these pastors are here and will be here after service. And don't forget, tonight is Family Life Night for a specific message for our families, our young kids and our teenagers, and come on back. Uh, Wednesday night service at 7 p.m. Um, keep on coming. Our Bibles are open just this week, right? So let's just pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Yes, God, thank you. You're doing a work in us, and by the grace of God, you're doing a work through us, in our families, in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our jobs and our situations. Father, we pray this message, Lord. We would not go through the doors and bury this message, but that we would meditate and talk about what we heard in the car, on the sidewalk, in the grocery store, and we would continually open our mouths and rehearse the things we've heard. Thank you we've been in your house. Cover us this week. Cover our lives. Traveling mercies blessing families and situations and difficult things, God. Yes, God, we bring them to you. We lay them at your feet. Bless our day and cover us in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.